Hello everyone, thanks for joining us on this important and urgent session on bullying and discrimination in the workplace. Um, I am Faraz Osman, I am the founder and managing director of independent production company Goldwaller and over the next hour or so we'll be discussing the ongoing issues within the film and TV industry. Please do note that some of the things that we're going to be discussing are naturally very sensitive so we ask that you be both respectful to yourselves and others. If you're watching this alone, make sure you check on yourself if anything is triggering any tricky emotions. And if you're watching this around others, please be aware that others might be able to hear what's being said. Um, we have an incredible panel of leading industry voices who have been working tirelessly to champion positivity in our industry and call out problematic behavior. Um, I do have a slight adjustment to this introduction, which is that my wife has literally just in the last 10 minutes gone into labour, um, which means we're going to be slightly changing this up. Um, and I'm going to be handing over to your very esteemed panel, which includes Paula, Max, Abby and Kate. Um, and Paula, if I could start with you, um, please give us an introduction into the work that you're doing at Back to, and of course yourself. Thanks, thanks for us. Um, so, um, sorry, am I coming through? I think so. Um, so, thank you very much. So, I'm a trade union official at Beck2. Um, I cover the London and Southeast area of film production. Um, uh, not only am I a um, trade union official, I'm also I have many many years experience in the industry as a location manager, working in um, primarily in TV comedy. But, um, across the industry and I think it's quite interesting what we're seeing so there's definitely a, a, a push as we've seen you know across the board and a lot of industry stakeholders a change in attitude about how we tackle um, bullying and harassment on set and having I came into the industry um, in the late 90s early 2000s so about 20 years ago and I think the difference is that the that what is perceived there's a difference in what is perceived as bullying and harassment so what we need to do i think is break the the culture that has been so prevalent in the industry so far and that is that this is a, a management style or this is how we interact with our colleagues on set and quite often the excuses for that behavior are a pressurized environment that um you know, some people will say, well, I this is how I was treated when I was a trainee and coming through and that everything needs to be done this minute or yesterday. And so I can speak to my colleagues how how I need to in order to make that happen. And interesting at Beck too, I think, which might be a different experience to the other panelists is we get both sides of the story often. So we uh, not only have the people come to us for support that feel that they've been bullied and harassed, we also have those people that have had allegations made against them. And we're starting to see formal processes and informal processes coming through being initiated with employers, which is which is fantastic. Um, and but there is there is an issue around um, how those processes are carried out, how we protect those the confidentiality of people in those processes, but also a wider issue of um, the conditions of the industry which are creating um, an increase in reporting, which is because there's avenues to do so, but also um, at the moment there's a skills shortage and I think historically people going into HOD roles, managerial roles to everyone else, um, have not had the support and the training that they need in order to be good at their jobs and learning how to manage people. And it's a very different skill of being very good at finding locations, very good at, um, at uh, the artistic side of our roles, the creative side of our roles, but also we need to learn how to manage people. And, and I think that's been lacking in industry so far and there's always been a lack of um, HR support so so the support around people that find themselves in these um, processes and procedures I think needs to improve and also we have um, a real skill shortage in the industry at the minute and people are stepping up very 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 quickly and um, not necessarily coping with those additional pressures particularly well um, and that's on both sides so I think those are the those are the issues and um, we could probably talk about the solutions um, to that a little bit more I'll hand over to another panelist maybe Kate hello 
Thanks, Paula. Um, my name is Kate Wilson. I am an independent producer, a lawyer, and a consultant working in film and the arts. And I've been working with the film and TV charity for almost two years now, way too long. I'm finishing very soon. Um, the way in which the film and TV charities engage with bullying and discrimination is via their mental health project, the whole picture program. And of course, you'd be unsurprised to learn that bullying and experiences of discrimination are one of the clearest threads and causes of poor mental health outcomes. So it is something that's really imperative for us to get to grips with and really very much within the scope of the work of the film and TV charity that is there to support individuals working in film, television, and cinema as well. Um, as a woman and individual working film, I've experienced harassment in many forms throughout my career, which is about 25 years now. And I think one of the issues that we need to get to grips with is exactly as Paula said, the way in which we consider HR not as a sort of abstract person in a gray suit sitting in a back office, but actually a very real day-to-day -day examination of the way in which we're using and exploiting and utilizing the human resource within film and television making. Because as a creative industry, it's that human resource that is the most valuable thing we're working with day-to-day. -day. Um, I had an analogy brought to me the other day when I was talking about harassment on set, and someone said, if you knew one of your camera team was consistently scratching a lens, you'd make sure they had some better education about what they were doing and some better training. So if you've got someone that is harassing people on set or making people uncomfortable or feeling um, feelings that they're not being looked after, then that person absolutely needs some education to understand what they were doing or they need to be removed because they are damaging the most valuable thing for you, which is that human resource. So I'm really keen to make sure that we as an industry understand not just what our rights are, this, this section is called Know Your Rights, and I think many of us do know our rights, but it's how do we enforce them? How do we make sure that we're accountable for them, both as individuals and collectively as an industry? And how do we make sure that we set a standard of behavior in film and TV that is, that is the best in the UK economy? Um, there's many things that make me actually question whether or not bullying and harassment is much worse in film and TV than anywhere else. Um, I'm now, I think, starting to think that it's not much worse. It's just that we have this kind of portal and we have the benefit of celebrity bringing some of these stories to the fore. But actually, I think we have an opportunity to be the best place to work in the UK, to be a sector leading economy when it comes to the way in which we treat each other, and to really be an attractive place for people to come and work, for young people to build careers and to be part of this incredibly credible growth, creative economy um, in, in the UK. So thank you so much. Shall I hand over to you, Abby? Yeah. Hi. Um, this is weird. We don't have a chair. Um, so uh, I am um, Abby. I work with the Coalition for Change, but outside of that, I'm a development producer working in comedy and entertainment. Um, so last year, the Coalition was, for Change was set up by um, a group of people after this massive groundswell of emotion that happened post, like when the pandemic first happened. There was the forgetting freelancers, the whole BLM movement, and there was a clear need that freelancers had for an open dialogue with the other vested interested parties, so broadcasters and all the kind of um, places like PACT, places like the film and TV charity, back to everyone kind of, it was clear that the industry model wasn't working and there were lots of problems within it and it all came to the fore. And so the best way to make a solution for those issues or attempt to actually address those issues would be via everyone coming around a table. So last August, the coalition was set up and we've got every broadcaster, a lot of the um, indies represented via PACT, um, a lot of the industry bodies are like the film and TV charity and Beck to, and we're we're in the process of creating a charter that will hopefully mean that there is an industry standard that is set that everyone can adhere to that will minimize things like bullying and harassment but it's much bigger than that as well and that when you think about it a lot of the reasons why freelancers don't know what uh, protections they have is because from company to company it varies and there's a whole issue there of there not being um, real transparency in our industry and so we're hoping by creating this charter we will have a minimum standard that everybody adheres to. Um, 
So that's uh, the coalition. Max, do you want to tell us a bit about what PACT are up to? Thanks for that, Abby. Um, so yeah, I'm Max Rumney. I'm from PACT. Uh, I'm a lawyer at PACT. I've worked in TV and film uh, for most of my career uh, in a range of different types of production company. Um, and I suppose, just to make you aware of you know, PAC's view on, uh, on this initiative, is that no employer wants an atmosphere of bullying and harassment at work. Um, it affects morale. Uh, more importantly, it affects people's creativity. And that is nothing, you know, that is not a situation that any producer would want. Um, I would say that most of our members already have procedures and policies in place uh, to deal with bullying and harassment and grievances and disciplinary situations. Um, and I think there's an often an accusation that these policies and procedures don't work or they're complicated. And just to sort of take those two things in turn, I think the narrative that they're complicated doesn't help our situation here because we do want people to use these policies and if they're fed the line that they're complicated uh, then I think that puts up a barrier to people using them to begin with uh, and from an employer's point of view they should not be complicated these procedures they should be straightforward they need to be transparent and they need to be impartial um, so that the person who's raising concerns or raising an allegation uh, knows that they're not going to suffer by using the policies and raising their concerns. And then also, as importantly, the person whom allegations are made against, uh, their rights are also respected. So we have this balance between someone who's complaining and someone's being complained about. Um, and I think what PACT has decided to do to try to help this situation is something that Abby just raised is that there are different uh, procedures and policies and so what we've been looking at for the members and listening to what they want from an employer point of view uh, we have been uh, reviewing all the resources available to them so that there, there are identical policies and procedures available to independent producers uh, there will be templates available to them so that investigations and inquiries are held in a similar way uh, and then we will have a resource function for HR so that the members can ring up uh, and check that they are using these policies and templates in the correct way. Uh, and now you might think, well, they should know how to do that. But as has been said, we've got a broad range of members. Some are small, one-man bands, uh, and that presents an issue in itself where you come to issues of bullying and harassment. And others are, are very large and so we want to make sure that those that aren't resourced are resourced and so we can put in place between us all i think uh, functions and uh, resources that work and procedures that work i mean i think my main concern really and it's sort of brought home at the weekend is my little goddaughter aged five you know told me at school no one rats no one rats and this is a sort of very English uh, way that no one is using our resources uh, and they should feel comfortable that they're able to use these resources. And then the second thing um, is the subjectiveness of some allegations uh, and what might seem, uh, what might seem uh, nonchalant to one person is highly offensive or upsetting to another person. And so I think on that, you know, we need more education. We need more education about how your behaviour affects other people. Uh, and that when people feel confident and they know their rights, then they will use these resources. Lawyers like me don't create resources and procedures and policies for them not to be used. So I would like to see these societal problems overcome so that the procedures that are there are actually used. Great. Um, we're being fed some of Faraz's questions. And so, you know, we'll sort of follow the structure. And one of the things that he was keen to talk about is to make sure we 
um, set out the landscape of what bullying and harassment actually is, what the differences are, and where the, the sort of civil and criminal threshold sits. Um, I think everyone will know that bullying does not have a legal definition, and almost every dictionary you pick up will have a slightly different definition. Often it refers to a balance of power between a perpetrator and a victim of bullying, um, an imbalance of power, sorry. Um, and uh, the, the experience of bullying is often that makes you feel um, intimidated and undervalued. And I think we all know exactly that feeling. I'd be surprised if there's a single person watching today who doesn't know what it feels like to be bullied. And it is um, important to recognize, as, as Max kind of indicated, that it can be a very subjective experience. And I, I think that it's fair to say that often people who are accused of bullying are completely surprised by the fact that their um, actions have had that, that impact, which is one of the difficulties of this area. A bullying experience becomes harassment when it involves one of the nine protective characteristics under the Equality Act 2010. I can probably see if I can remember off the top of my head what those are. Um, let's see if I can find them listed, but they are, I think we all know what they are. They are gender, age, sex, sexual orientation, marriage or civil partnership, disability, race, and ethnicity, and I think I'm missing one. Um, a pregnancy and maternity and gender reassignment. So I'm, I'm happy to put that uh, in the chat box later so that everyone can see. Um, but the second one of those uh, uh, protected characteristics that involves, then the Equality Act does step in, which means that if you're experiencing um, discrimination, which is what harassment is, it sits on discrimination within the Equality Act, the, the jurisdiction of the employment tribunal can come into place, and that doesn't require anything like the two years lead time. You can absolutely go into the employment tribunal. What's important to understand, though, is that there are many experiences of bullying that are equally devastating that do not involve a protected characteristic, and that list is finite and imperfect. So, for example, um, we do not uh, consider socioeconomic background as one of the protected characteristics. And I think that there's quite a bit of discussion going on in legal quarters about whether or not that list within the Equality Act should be extended to have different characteristics within it. So the landscape is pretty interesting. We know that there are things like criminal sexual assault. We know that the Equality Act sets, steps in to do two things, which is to prevent discrimination, indirect discrimination, harassment, and victimization. And victimization is really important because that's the thing that if you raise a complaint, prevents you from losing your job. The issue I think we have in this discussion, which is about how we treat one another in the workplace environment, is how we navigate, of course, the laws and the rules, but extend them far into the everyday working experience, experiences that we have and make sure that we, um, we don't have to rely on the law. We don't want people having to go and make claims in the employment tribunal. We want to make sure that we've set a standard that everybody understands so that there are fewer breaches of, of the rules and, of course, of internal HR procedures. And I absolutely agree with, with Max in terms of PACT. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic sharing resources for HR procedures. But if people don't feel that they can access them, if they don't feel confident, or equally, if they're a freelancer on a three-day job and they don't think it's worth their energy to raise a formal grievance and go through a formal procedure, then we can start seeing an escalation of behaviors and, in fact, a sort of tacit endorsement of behavior of behaviors when individuals simply move from production to production and continue acting in the way that they've been acting, which is damaging to others. I wonder if we should move on. I think there's it's something not, I here think there was a you. Yeah, there's a question for Abby in there. Oh, yeah, it's, is that, sorry, my phone. Um, yeah, the nature of bullying and harassment things things aren't black and white so how do we navigate things when they aren't clear um which i think kind of kate touched on a bit there it's like it it's difficult to when you're in the moment to know if it's a situation which you can complain about because it's so um it's so sub almost it feels so subjective to you that it's not a thing that you would have seen happen to someone else before and be like that's exactly what's happening to me I think you feel that it's wrong though and I think it's best to talk to people about it and I think a lot of the time people don't feel confident enough to talk to people about it because 
of the freelance nature of television and of the fact that you know you just hear stories where things haven't happened as a result of people complaining and so you're like they're not going to do anything for me um and then you also don't want to be seen as a troublemaker and there's so many issues that we have to address as an industry to make sure that people feel comfortable disclosing but i know that there's for example the back to unseen on screen um campaign that they did at the end of last year had really good results within the freelancer community of people actually being like oh no that happened to me as well i can see this pattern of behavior um from these people um and so there's a lot of work to be done i think it's very difficult to be like this is exactly what you can do the film and tv charity have a few tools that they are developing and have developed that people can use as well like the spot tool but there's a long way to go i think in the ways that people can disclose issues i mean i think a good thing that's happened recently probably not good but um good example of actual repercussions happening is the Noel Clark and Charlie Hansen issues that happened is it Charlie Hansen um that happened recently um yeah i Does can come back in, in on yeah no i i will jump back in thanks abby so i think there's there's a few things that I, I'm particularly you touched on the sort of fear of reporting and that that's something that we um, deal with a lot. So I have conversations regularly with members of crew who will give me a rundown of historic things that have happened to them throughout their career because often they kind of you know it's somebody of in an organization that that is sat around having these discussions that hears about their experiences and and they will say at the end of that saying well of course i never reported that because i know it would damage my career that will affect my reputation and we really do need to address protecting freelancers from raising these questions because uh, and raising these issues because until we do that we're really not going to get um, a real um, a representation of how people are feeling in the industry and what the reality is on the ground. And I think that's really important. Um, also, um, it's we, we sort of talk about freelancers being precarious in terms of um, what uh, legal avenues of support that they that they are that have access to in compared in comparison to those who are employed over two years time you know serve time and have access to the tribunal um process uh, and grievance process within a company however having worked in the trade union areas where we have recognition and clear grievance uh, policies and procedures that those procedures aren't always perfect and the tribunal is not always the ideal place considering that the waiting lists are very very long and um, often it takes a certain type of mentality of person to to want to relive that process again and again until they get to a tribunal and get an answer it takes a, a huge amount of commitment and it doesn't always get the resolution that they're looking for so what i have found is is the the sort of the way forward to this is opening up communication and mediating a communication so often the first step of getting an element of relief from the anxiety created by bullying um, and harassment is really i sit on the phone for, for a long long time with um our members and they will tell me from start to finish their experience and often just that process then at the end they say i feel so much better having got that all out and so then if you start to mediate between um the production company uh, so they can share their experiences of how they found a particular job and then relay that onto the um, person that has um, that that is being accused of bullying um, as Kate rightfully pointed out often when you take these um, allegations to the person um, in question they are often shocked that their behavior has been construed as bullying and that the person on the receiving end feels the way that they have done and has expressed that and 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 that process i think is fundamental we need to look at this in a holistic way there's a lot of talk about um target you know you know sort of 
um, getting bullies out of the industry and um, sort of you know targeting them and 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 putting penalties in place which which is important then there should be um, there should be penalties in place for behaving like this but we also need to look at holistically of how we've got here and also how we then resolve that so everybody has it as not a positive experience but at least a learning process from the start to finish so um my experience of the of of the processes that have been initiated and used and are very new is that there's a there's often a very poor understanding of what that process involves where it starts where it finishes and what the likely outcome is and also those people's obligation to comply and to to um connect and take part in that process if they if their employment contract has then finished and we're still going through the process two weeks later they they're, they're you know getting on another job and 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 very very busy at, at what you know what point does that do, do we end up with a resolution and are they do they have to you know still partake in that process most people want to to be honest but they could not and so we need to we need to think as a whole industry how we tackle that um collectively um when you know when when we uh, come up against these problems kate yeah i think that's such an interesting area and i just wanted to acknowledge particularly given that we're at sheffield duck fest that there are so many different ways of making content so when we talk about our industry and we talk about setting standards we're making quite a quite a lot of assumptions um, Documentaries, for example, often start in a very informal space, often with grants funding, often with arts funding. We're not necessarily talking about a kind of formal commission where something goes into production on a specific day and therefore policies and procedures should be in place. So that threshold is really challenging, I think. You know, what can we expect in terms of the standard and who, who has to reach that standard? For my part, one of the things I'm really interested in, and I know that Abby and I see this a little bit, differently, but is whether or not there is an option for a kind of centralized reporting mechanism. For me, I think that there could be kind of several reporting systems whereby people could call and, and um, uh, you know, set up their experience to an independent group. But I don't think there can be one that's industry wide without some sort of regulation or legislation to set it up. And I don't think that's something that anybody wants or needs. Um, for me, it's much more of a cultural and behavioral change that we're looking for um, that, of course, ultimately make sure that people are accountable for their actions as individuals and that we collectively make sure we raise that standard. But there is, you know, there is a real issue, the dissonance between the theory and the practice of reporting bullying and harassment is, I think, the real challenge that we have to address. So, for example, when it came to the Noel Clark allegations, we're talking about, I think, at last count, within the last Guardian article, so I'm sure it's increased, but 26 individual women. And there is power in numbers. Of course, the theory is that there shouldn't be. We should be listening to every single woman's voice when they say that they've been sexually harassed. We should be looking, listening to every single worker's voice when they say that they've been bullied in one of our productions. But because of that kind of power in numbers, there was, there was action that was taken and each of those women was able to feel more secure knowing that they were not taking that stand alone and being able to engage, I think, at different thresholds. So not having to take a um, criminal approach, although I understand there is a criminal investigation that's going on, but being able to work with an investigative journalist who's working to a particular standard themselves and who is obviously looking at work in terms of the balance of probability of this feeling to them like it's the truth. Um, the way in which I think we really failed with the Noah Clark allegations, and I'm, I'm trying to understand it better, is the idea of an organization, an institution like BAFTA, feeling that they have no choice. My feeling in everything I do in life is that I always have a choice. There might be repercussions, repercussions and risks to that choice, but if you ever feel that you don't have a choice to make as an individual, when it comes to your behavior and when it comes to things like supporting women or individuals who have experienced discrimination or sexual harassment with this type of bullying behavior, then we're failing. We should always feel like we can take an active and positive choice. I'm really keen for us to look um, as, a, as an industry, and I'm really um, encouraging the charity to look at things like active bystander training so that we know how to support people that are having difficult times and we know when and how to step in in a way that's constructive. Um, and, and, you know, as, as I said, that we don't go down this path where we all feel 
that we have to condone behavior that we know in our gut and in our hearts is not behavior that we should ever be condoning. I agree with that. I think there's a massive problem with power dynamics and the power that people feel in the industry. And so a lot of the time, people who are in, like, you're at the whim of the director or the on-screen talent. And a lot of it comes with those people not feeling that they are accountable for their actions. Um, and so there needs to be a space in which like right from the start, it's set out that everybody is accountable. We often talk about what happens once the incident has occurred, but we rarely do talk about, or we don't talk about as much, why those incidents are occurring in the first place. And you could say it's, number one, it's the power dynamic and the lack of um, people, certain people feeling accountable for their actions. Uh, number two, it's probably a lot of people don't get management training. No, you're just a really good director, so you become a director. You're a really good actor, so you become an actor. If you're managing teams and if you don't know how to manage teams, often you're not going to, you're, you're probably going to be a bit of a bully, expect things from people that it doesn't come naturally to everyone is what we're saying. And there's a lack of training. There's a lack of, um, and I think, Paula, that you touched on that earlier as well. Um yeah, I think that that's a huge thing that people should be looking at is all those things that lead to lead to the um, environment in which these situations occur. Does anyone Thanks, think Abby. things have gotten better yeah. in the last year? Or I was going to put that yeah to to. Uh, Max, because I know I don't think you can see the uh, questions, but it's just um, there was a question in the chat about or in our chat that was um, how do how do we think we're doing right now? I don't know, Max, if you have a good overview of that. Uh, I th I th well, it's uh, the one thing we can all agree on is that awareness of this issue has skyrocketed, and everyone is now aware of this being a potential issue. Um, I, I don't have any transparency in a meaningful way about, you know, have things got better or worse, but I think it, as long as there's an awareness out there and it's in a growing awareness, then that can only be a good thing. In terms of education, and Abby was talking about education, um, it, we really need a broad suite of um, educational, sort of training, don't we? Because you were talking about management training. I was talking mm -hmm. earlier about, you know, legal training and knowing your rights. And Kate was speaking about that. And, you know, and this is even before we sort of got on to sort of behavioral training. So it's understanding that all these different elements, you know, whether you might think it's just business, you might just think it's just law, but these things all feed into combating bullying and harassment. And educating people on how they ought to be behaving towards each other. Sorry, Kate, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to share with everyone that the film and TV charity undertook a survey about two years ago called the Looking Glass Survey about mental health, but included a lot of questions about um, bullying and harassment. And they are reissuing that survey. It's out now, I think, for another few weeks. Um, the first round had 9,000 completed um, uh, surveys, which is about 5% of the eligible uh, people that could have completed it. And that's statistically very, very powerful. So really, really useful set of data came out of that. It will be more useful as it becomes a longitudinal repeated survey. And I think that we'd be kind of foolish if we expected things to look any better already. I think that when you start shaking that tree, things are going to look worse, as, as, as Max said, you know, that things are coming to the surface and that's got to be a healthy process if a very uncomfortable and, and challenging one. But please do complete that survey, anyone who's, who's watching and, and you guys, because it is a really useful tool. It's not supposed to be for beating the industry with and telling us how bad we are. As I said, I'm not that convinced that we're much worse than anybody else. Um, but we have an opportunity to be the best. And because we're so small, if we can understand the issue better by doing things that, you know, proper surveys that have proper benchmarks and proper, um, you know, re real, real rigorous data analysis, then we should be able to have some longer term interventions that have an, a recognizable impact in a few years ahead. I, I think I from our perspective, oh, sorry, there's somebody else. 
jumping in now. Um, I think from our perspective, what's interesting is there certainly does seem to be um, a shift in understanding of rights and understanding um, of the level of expected behaviour. So we, we're we receiving um, uh, complaints or issues raised that previously, I think, for the majority of crew would be seen as accepted behavior oh well i just like that oh well you know so and so he you know these can be a bit like that or or um yeah it's kind of tolerated because of um because of certain hod's especially is brilliant in other avenues so so you know it's just like well they like it this way or they like it that way they don't like people to do this and don't understand that sometimes that this this actually in a, you know in the wider context would you tolerate this this way of speaking to people so what we're finding is that certainly those issues are raised at a much earlier stage and the recognition of the um of the behavior being unacceptable is is much more readily um, understood by the sort of newer generation of film and TV workers. So, and obviously, um, and and a change in um, in attitude is having an impact within the industry. So, I think um, with this this issue is going to become bigger in the way that we're just going to start hearing about it much much more as we have done, um, and there's going to be some teething problems as we go through and start um, using these processes which will not be perfect initially but will we as long as we continue working together and having using them as a learning process um, and then uh, changing and tweaking them where they aren't working and keep talking about that things can only get better I think. Okay. just wanted to um, thank I just wanted to uh, really add to your point about young people coming into the industry. I mean, we've spoken about the skill shortage. I moved back here from Los Angeles 20 years ago, and it was pretty hard to figure out a career path at that point in film and TV, and I retrained as Laura as a consequence. Now we have this incredible growth in our industry. We've got much clearer career paths. I don't just say this because my 17-year-old is doing a filmmaking course, but she is. And I really want her to know that the industry that she may go into is a positive one where she will be valued. And she's much more literate and intelligent when it comes to these kind of issues about how we treat one another. And her generation looks to corporations. There's something called the Edelman Trust Report. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it is um, a, a global survey whereby people are asked, it, it's really for kind of media institutions, but what that recognizes is that younger people are looking to their employers to take a stand on societal issues. Where this has happened most clearly, even in our industry with Albert, I think is with environmental causes. So a young person who is being courted by many, many potential employers will look at things like their sustainability policies and their environmental policies to consider whether or not they're taking they're the type of place they want to work. And I think that people young people will start looking at mental health support, well-being support, and approaches towards codes of conduct while they're looking at where they might want to work, including from an industry-wide standpoint. So we've had a few things that happen because we are so public-facing. You know, the Harvey Weinstein stuff, um, Caroline Flack, Love Island, um, obviously Noel Clark and Charlie Hansen more recently. These things really can take the sheen off our industry and it's really imperative that we're seen to respond so that we remain an exciting place for people to work so that they know that there's a career path for them, that this is a really valuable, justified and valued step for them to take to work in our industry, but that they'll also be treated well and can expect to be treated well and can expect to be expected to treat other people well too. I'd agree I with you about Albert. Sorry. Um, yeah. No, Matthew, Albert, has been, okay, Albert has been very successful in raising awareness about environmentally sustainable production. Uh, and this has happened over a number of years, uh, but now it's got to the point that, you know, this is a process within nearly all types of production. And also, it's not something that's being forced from the top down. You do have you know, talent and crew who have their own specific requirements and concerns about the environment and want things done 
in a specific way. And if we can try and emulate that with the issues around bullying, harassment, you know, we can sort of make everyone aware that it is their issue. And over time that we can rectify this, I think Albert is something that we need to emulate really in, in terms of education and going back to this point about education. I agree I to a argue. point, but there, there, are vic there, are, there are casualties of bullying and harassment. That, that's, that's my concern. I agree about Albert, but I think the difference is that we are losing people to bullying and harassment as individuals, but also from the industry. So it's, it's much more critical. It's much more urgent, I think. You know, I don't want to get in a people versus climate change debate, but in terms of our industry today, I think people can be helped today who are at risk. Sorry, Abby. No, I was just going to say, I think in when going back to the question, rather than it being a race to the bottom, which it felt like it was in the last year, I think they are racing to the top almost. Everyone wants to outdo each other with their diversity policies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which can only really be a good thing. The, we won't see the results of that for years, um, probably three to five years, I think you would probably see some results in. But um I think that there is a lot to be hopeful about. There's a lot to um, for young freelancers who are entering this industry to feel positive about. There's lots of great resources for freelancers as well, like that are informal. There's the TV mindset that's on Facebook. It's a great place for uh, mental health, uh, just chat for freelancers. Um, and so I think also, as a result of freelancers collecting in the way that they have over the past year, um, no one can ignore them. And the power of the collective voice, as I think Kate was talking about earlier, is is like shattering for these big uh, broadcasters or funders. And so they realise that they need to do something about it and they need to be seen to be doing something about it. And it has to be substantial action because there are lots of freelancers with big voices now who will call them out if it does not, if they don't act in a way that people um, see results from. Thanks, Abby. So, yeah, I think, um, I think certainly it's interesting in terms of I know from speaking to to our members that a lot of people have had a really really tough year so we've gone out from from obviously lockdown last year to one of the busiest times that we've ever experienced um in the film and television industry particularly and i think we need to really focus like i said i think i said earlier on the holistic nature of what the reality for workers is uh, on on film and TV sets and in production, um, extremely long hours, extremely pressurized environments and uh, a no questions asked, get the job done attitude coming from the top down, essentially. And whilst um, what my concern is, is that we spend a lot of time talking about these issues and everybody is saying the right things and making the right noises and producing the right um, uh, documents and we perfect the procedures etc but actually the environment that people are working in which is highly pressurized very long hours people you know the impact on people's mental health at the minute because of these long hours with the additional pressures of covid restrictions on set is having a real impact and what um, I'm hearing, particularly from HODs um, that are coming through, is they, in reflection of having some time to think about it during the lockdown, is that actually they they're say, they're questioning whether this industry is for them and whether they can manage balancing and um, managing staff well, managing their team well, and those pressures of long hours, tighter budgets, um, and and you know that those last minute changes that happened these are all the things that create the atmosphere where people sort of have a very short fuse and behave in ways which on reflection is not the desired um, uh, way to behave on set and way to speak to people and I think we do need to look at how the industry you know we work some of the longest hours in this industry in this country across Europe and we really do need to, to and under the, the toughest pressures in terms of 
in terms of scheduling. So I think we do need to give people on set, give crew the best opportunity to be able to uphold these principles of um, treating people well and with respect, but we need to give them all the tools in order to do that. So I hand over to you, Kate. Yeah, I was just going to share some some numbers because I think it's really important to remember that we're not talking about pulling people's heartstrings, really. We're talking about what's best for business at the end of the day. Um, mental health problems, including uh, absenteeism, not turning up for work, presenteeism, which is when you turn up for work, but you're not capable of doing the job, and turnover, losing people um, from, from work, cost the UK economy about 45 billion year, pounds a year. And if you kind of back, reverse engineer that into film and TV, it's about 300 million pounds per year. And so there's a huge incentive for us to make sure that people feel looked after and that there's support available. And that actually, you know, things like hugely pressured sets, we'd be much better off making sure that time is managed a little bit better and that people have some breathing space and have access to someone to talk to, et cetera, et cetera, than pushing people as hard as we can to the point where we break them. And again, this comes back to the idea of the fact that a human resource has to be looked after. You know, in the olden days when I started working in film, if you got a certain number of feet of film to make a movie, you valued that resource. You made sure that you were very, very careful with it. As I said before, if you've got a beautiful camera on set and someone keeps on scratching the lens, you value that re resource. You make sure you're careful with it. You make sure there are skills and training and things are carefully put away. And we're not doing that with our people. And actually, that is what costs so, money, so much money day to day within the film business, is the number of people that we have on a set. So if we can figure out a way to invest in them sensibly and to make sure that people don't get to breaking point, it is a smart business decision. You'll find that there's better productivity, less absenteeism, less presenteeism, and much less turnover as well. Go ahead, Matt. Thanks, Kate. Max, you want to come in here? Yeah, um, we're all in danger of agreeing with each other. This is going to be a very boring panel, isn't it? Um, I, I'd agree that this does need to be looked at holistically. And I think from a producer point of view, um, when we're talking about pressurized uh, environments and short you know, filming periods, undoubtedly that will lead to people being felt that they're put under pressure and have to work long hours. And that sort of conversation needs to be raised and had with you know, the financiers, the commissioners, the broadcasters, because you know, if you're producing a documentary, I can tell you the BBC's rates for documentaries have not gone up in 10 years. Now, the cost of making a documentary has gone up. So what, what has happened there? How can these documentaries still be made? And we know how that's still made, is there's less money, we have to be made quicker, and that causes problems that all are just outlined. And you know, some people can do this, but you know, it, as soon as a producer is commissioned and they say, you know, it's going to cost me a hundred thousand pounds to make this documentary, as, as soon as the business person at the other end of the broadcaster says, Well, can you do it for eighty? There is an impact of doing it for 80, which is not all about what happens on screen. A lot of it will be about what happens behind the camera. Thanks, Max. Abby, do you have anything to add to that? I just, I agree with everything that Kate said in terms of, you know, ultimately freelancers are the biggest asset any production has in terms of, um, money wise it's an investment and they should be seen as an investment as well and also you know every our industry is ruled by money um so it is important that we make that financial argument of it it does decrease absenteeism it does decrease people being um being off sick etc etc it increases the quality of the program as well i think and which will result in sales etc 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 um so yeah that's all i have to add the, the more obvious business argument obviously is you know things like bulletproof being cancelled the cost of that 
must be absolutely astronomical viewpoint being moved from broadcast. I know it was still available on iPlayer 2, but but those costs are absolutely huge. And and you know, there was a way for that not to have happened. I, I can add to that. I have been on productions that have been halted because of um, alleged behaviour um, and have been put on hiatus. And, and you can only imagine the costs of that, of standing down a crew for a week while something is investigated, you know, quite serious allegations. And so um, the, it is about, I think, um, it, we, we do need to improve this. So it, it ensures, um, not literally ensures, but protects from these, you know, this sort of outcome, uh, um, and it, it should be part, you know, part of every uh, production company they take uh, and production that they take steps in order to ensure that their their production um, and and business is protected. There was one thing actually we hadn't talked about in terms of measures. Something that was really interesting uh, that was raised with me the other day is that um, there was a production that offered a, count, a counselor. To be on hand so they would work completely independently of any member of crew so production were never given um, the producers and production were never given the con the you know the details of what was discussed and it was literally um the they the production bought a, a block uh, booked a, a slot um for um uh, or number of slots for for crew to be able to book in a session with a counselor and talk about the issues they were experiencing on the job and just use somebody as a bit of a sounding board get on the chest and know that that was completely anonymous and that they could do that and um it was interesting because when even though details weren't divulged that counselor was able to go back to production and go do you know this amount of people have booked in with me this week and this is the level of morale in, on in your production and i thought that was really interesting way of actually taking a, a practical and useful step to be able to support a uh, crew because quite often being able to speak about it to somebody that you know is completely confidential is the first step of actually being able to report it so they can articulate it talk to somebody you know uh, get it out in the open and then consider what they do next. Yes, Kate. Um, I just want to make sure everyone does know that there's also the film and TV charity support line. And that's a confidential support line and does lead to access to tier two services, things like counseling, various types of counseling that can happen online and can happen according to the realities of crew schedules and, and, and that kind of thing. There's also now a bullying pathways service and that is that listening ear that you might need. And also, um, if you need advice about the process that you might go through if you wanted to report or what the options are that are available to you. And um, we're hoping that those services will be permanent services that will become part of the core service of the film and TV charity after the whole picture program. Cool, I think what you were saying was really interesting about the, about the counselor on set. And I think that, you know, that is an ideal situation, well, not ideal, but, you know, it's a good situation to be in, to have people be able to talk to somebody on set in these very, like, long hour days. However, we all know, and I think Max would probably attest to this, is, like, budgets are shrinking for programmes that are being made. And so that is a luxury that not all production companies, especially smaller ones who might be on minimal budgets making minimal profit on a programme that they're making, um can afford so it's really about collective responsibility it's about the people who are funding that film making sure that there is the ability to have a situation like that the production company being open to creating that situation and the freelancers actually using that resource as well which they will do evidently um so i yeah which is what the coalition is really trying to do is getting all these people in a room together all these vested party and being able to actually say this is what we need and distinctively have a model that works for every level of the industry. I think we have a few minutes left. I don't know if Max you want to sort of bring it to a close if anyone else had anything else they want to say. Um, no I, I think what, I, what I've seen during the course of the last year or so is there is far more dialogue like this which I think is a good thing because my impression and you may tell me I was wrong but 
there seemed to be a lot of work done on bullying and harassment, but it was siloed really. So thanks to the Coalition for Change and the film and television charity, I, I do feel things that are being pulled together more and it, it's more apparent where people can look for help and resources. From PAC's point of view, it, what, I, what I've set out to try to do is to su support employers so that they're aware of the resources that are available to them so they, they can properly use their policies and their procedures and they will get advice on using those. Um, and so, you know, we will always engage with these initiatives across the industry. But, you know, you must always tell me if you think there is more that our members could benefit from as an employer. Uh, and I'm always available to listen about Thanks, Matt. So just to, so just to add in terms of Beck2, obviously um, we encourage our, our members, we encourage people to join, but also our members to get in touch if they ever feel that they are the victim of bullying. Um, we've also been working with um, employers and ACAS to produce um, a, a complaints procedure that can be that can be universally used so everybody knows the process and have a similar process across across the industry so people become familiar about what's expected and the correct way to deal with things um i don't know if anyone else wants to raise anything that they're currently doing oh the coalition we're just working on our charter at the moment we're always open to hearing from people freelancers anyone who wants to have an input we've got lots of members and you can there's a fair few freelancer groups that will listen as well and as I said, the Film and TV Charity has the support line and the Bullying Pathway Service. We are um, still only about eight months into the Whole Picture Program, which is a two-year program of work. And we're looking at the kind of longer term, probably 10-year strategy that will sit behind that to make sure that people's mental health is properly supported throughout their careers. And um, you know, please do call that support line. It's completely confidential. There's a listening ear, but there are also further services that you can access. Thank you all. I guess is we don't have a chair, so we're just we're busking the end of it a little bit. But yeah. um, I think we're we're very much on our last minute. So um, I will say thank you to everybody for uh, for coming along, getting involved, and the amazing work. Um, I know that we work with uh, the union. Beck who works um, with all of you, and and it's always really productive and constructive um, our discussions and the work that we do. So hopefully, pulling in all the right direction, we can really make a change. Uh, to the creative industries in terms of how we tackle bullying and harassment. Great. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Much. Thank you. Bye, I think then I think we're we're there. <laughs> okay. <this> panel. Thank you. <laughs>